Hello there, my name is Corey Durbin, CEO of Shared Health Alliance, and I'd like to welcome you to Running Eyes, a podcast where we take a meaningful, deep dive into the relationships, strategies, and global mission of ASH to change healthcare and change lives. I feel very fortunate to be with one of my close friends tonight, Scott Miller. Scott and I both live uh, out in the Washington State area. He's in his office tonight and I'm in mine and he opened his own pediatric practice back in 2017. And Scott, it's so good to be with you. I appreciate you taking the time this late in the evening. My pleasure. I I was looking forward to talking with you. We don't get to see each other enough. Well, I I know we don't. And I know you you keep some odd hours as it is. And uh, (laughs) that's, I, I mean, you you almost don't have a, a like, you know, I, I got her to even say nine to five, but I mean, crazy hours for you, right? Yeah, um, I would. I mean, some would say they're self-imposed. Um, there are so many complexities to a lot of a lot of these these patients that if I'm not constantly studying and and learning and looking at new tests and and therapies for these families, then we can't. You know, the, the goal is to to find a way to help our our families maximally thrive. You know, whatever that that limit is, and. And so I, yeah, well, I mean, I don't want to even, tell I don't want to tell a mom I didn't take the time to answer those questions or to learn or study to be able to to figure out how to help your child. Um, a lot of the discoveries come at two, three, four at night when I'm reading. Some of us call that the morning. <laughs> mm, no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, but you know, I, I, even in even in this answer that you gave to that first question, I I can under I sense your passion. I already know how real your passion is for your for your patients, and you know we've talked a little bit about this before, but I think one of the reasons you opened your own practice was because you wanted to be able to explore other avenues. Is that is that fair? I would say that, yeah, that would be the, the driving force behind needing to, to branch out. But even some of what I consider the more standard routine labs or therapies were frowned upon for some reason. Um, you know, anything that deemed experimental uh, just didn't fly. So I was basically left with you either just toe the line and and do what everybody else is doing or open up a practice and and find a way to overturn every rock that that I can to to answer the you know to to help these families help the children. Yeah, that's a little bit of the the old adage, right? If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting the same result or the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? And this whole idea behind Alliance for Shared Health and the Health Share program was, you know, we've we've got to find a different way to do healthcare. And when you talk about alternatives, yours is yours a combination between, you know, medical and some of maybe what I would call nutraceuticals? I don't know if that's the right word. It's it's all medical, right? I mean, if if your vitamin D levels are low, which is, you know, that's bad on many, many levels, there isn't a, a pharmaceutical drug that you can take to increase your vitamin D. You either live in, in a, a climate that's closer to the equator or you take something to help boost your vitamin D levels. And, mm. you know, I find... You know, with with what we've done to our our soil, the way we've modified so many of our foods, the the you know five billion tons of glyphosate sprayed on it every year, uh, it's getting harder and harder. Just as I'm the deeper I get into to a lot of the labs, the organic acid tests and amino acid tests and 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 stool or or microbiome tests, we we start to find out that you know maybe you're not able to convert these these vitamins into their their methylated or or available forms and it's not it's not just well that's a bummer that these are these are the b6 is what converts tyrosine to dopamine that's not unimportant that's really important Mm -hmm. um and so you know when you when i have you know an eight-year-old uh you know a new patient that mom brings in and she's on two different atypical antipsychotics a stimulant trazodone for sleep i and I'm like, okay, so she must be doing great, right? They fixed it. And the answer, you know, like mom's basically in tears. She's like, I don't know what to do. The side effects, I mean, it's just, there's only so many things a, a pharmaceutical drug can fix. And do I use them? Yeah, like the, they can be miracles for a lot of kids. But when we start looking, when we start kind of breaking things down and getting these labs, you know, do they need to be on 60 milligrams of Ivance? I've had kids that have gone from 60 to 10 
because of other things that we've done to help boost those pathways. So it doesn't mean that you can get off everything, but man, if you can get a child off of four of the five medications they're on because you're, you know, you can find a way to help them sleep in a more natural way and, and they're, we're able to change their diet and, and get things out of their diet that are wreaking havoc on them. It's just, it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more commitment from the parents and, and collaboration, but man, like when you get, when I get that text, like three days later, even it's, it, there are enough wins that it makes it, like it just charges me up to just mm. keep grinding it out. And, and, you know, it's just that relentless pursuit for, for finding, I just call it finding truth, finding answers to help, to help a child, to help a family. Yeah. Well, I, I think what, what's interesting is the, there's probably a bit of a stigma behind using holistic methodologies and you quickly sort of rephrased my question and said no that's med you know that's medicine that's medical and um for me personally i i love that whole concept because it's it, it really changed my life working with a holistic doctor who really focused on alternate forms of therapy I had some low back issues for years that really cured me of and i you know we're um told in the bible that that we that that the that the trees and the plants that are first of all that our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made right and that the the trees and the plants will be food for our medicine for us if i i'm sure i've butchered that verse at the moment but i think you know where i'm going with that and so if we can get rid of this stigma a little bit that alternate forms of therapy are not medicine that they're actually a form our body that's 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 catering to the things our body needs then maybe just changing that mindset for people can uh, you have to believe in the therapy that you're trying i would i would i guess is where i'm going with that well i mean you don't you don't have to and an example i had a dad that came in about a month ago and his wife had begged him to come in uh, high levels of anxiety, pretty significant allergies, mild intermittent asthma. But as he was sitting there, his first few minutes of chatting with him, and I just asked him, like, how is your, your anxiety right now? And he just, you know, it's like there's this heavy weight. And, you know, I, you know, I point mm -hmm. to his chest, like, do you feel that heavy weight right there? And he's like, yeah, it's just always there. And I, and I said, if I give you something right now, would you be okay taking it? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I came in here and grabbed a 750 milligrams of GABA, the an amino acid, cup of water, and said, just take this and just, you know, touch base with us later. Let me know if, if you notice anything different. And about mm, 20 minutes later, we were chatting and he stopped me. He's like, so uh, that feeling that I had in my chest, he said, it's gone. I feel a little in my tummy, you know, and mm -hmm. feel a little in my stomach, but I feel like, like that weight is gone. And I smiled. And I said, weird, huh? He's like, yeah, what, what was that? And, and I told him, I'm like, listen, it's, it's not voodoo. I mean, that's, if you went in for surgery and they'll put something over your, your face, they'll put a, put an IV in, have you count backwards. And then you wake up some unknown time later and you remember nothing and you felt nothing. Well, how, how is that possible? Well, they even an anesthesiologists like, well, we really don't know how, you know, propofol works, but, but they, you're bombing our GABAergic pathway. And, and that, that's the, the, parasympathetic pathway, the calming pathway. So, you know, you can take gabapentin, which has many different uses, but, you know, if you can take GABA and some high dose, you know, higher dose magnesium gluconate, I mean, there, and you can decrease that, that feeling of stress and anxiety by 50% in 20 minutes. I mean, that's not voodoo. No, it's not. And that's, you know, that's the cool thing about science. It must be very rewarding to, and even heartbreaking to have so many um, parents come to you with kids who are really, they don't know how to help them. And I know you and I had the good fortune of meeting through a men's golf ministry that we, we have uh, up at Gamble Sands every year. And uh, we were playing some golf together a few months ago. And I mentioned my own daughter's challenges with sleep. And it seemed like I hit a hot button for you in that. <laughs> and for us, I know this, I have a daughter who's high. I mean, you, you know, you've worked with her, but she's highly motivated. She's disciplined. She wants to excel and she doesn't sleep. And so, you know, you, you go through this challenge of you want to encourage and sometimes discipline and sometimes be hard on your, your child and go, well, how is it fair when you know she slept for an hour and a half the whole night, you know? 
And so um, us getting to you on this situation, getting a chance to have our daughter visit with you uh, has been very, has given us hope. And so I would imagine that's an aspect of what you do that's really rewarding. Well, well, first of all, thank you. And, and something that we, I mean, we're out golfing and all of a sudden, I, you know, not what <laughs> I feel, I felt like I was kind of prying. I was like, so what, tell me a little more, what's going on, you know? <laughs> It's like, hey, let me hit my shot, dude. Right? We don't, <laughs> we don't need to talk. We don't need to top shot, you know, talk shop right now. We're golfing, but you know, I remember you mentioning something, and my mind just started whirling. I'm like, huh? You know, like what's I'm going glad. on? Like, how how can we? How We're can? Is there a way that we can help her? Um, and and just you know, it's interesting what you just said. So you take, you know, just say a teenager could be any, you know, kids, young adults, adults. You know, when you have, you know, even these kind of, um, how do you say, it, kind of categories of of personalities. Because I think it was when when your wife had brought your daughter in. You may have been there when I started asking some specific questions, some general, but and but generally it's like you know, high academic achiever, you know, very motivated. Um, Right. You know, oftentimes they can have a, a high level of inner anxiety, but a, a calm exterior and, until it kind of overcomes them. Very competitive with themselves, especially having little threshold for, for making what what we would consider, you know, mistakes where other people might not. Um, being very kind of either obsessive about things or compulsive or having, you know, a strong need for routine or control over their environment. Um like those, you know, just just those types of things, you know, having it, it gives if me somebody... goosebumps as you describe her because it's it's like you're, it's uncanny that you're describing my daughter, and I mean, I think you did that really the first time you met her, you know. Yeah, she had well, to yeah, it was, all these things. No, well, no, um, but that's that's when I do I do a lot of telemed um, visits, and a lot of times I'll just I'll ask the parents. Are you okay sending me a picture, like a, a profile and, and front view of of your child? Because that 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 picture, even the side, you know, the side view can tell me a lot about what's going on. You know, if they've got a retronathic jaw, you know, where that seems like kind of an underdeveloped jaw, that's a problem. That's not just like, hmm, now he's you know, they're gonna need orthodontia and a lot of a lot of dental work. That tells me how likely how they're breathing. That's a mouth breather. That's they're, they're not going to have good sleep. Meaning, if we tracked their sleep patterns, it, it would it would not look good. They're going to have a harder time managing their emotions. I mean, just generally speaking, because when you're mouth breathing, you're not breathing through your nose. That's a problem. That's how your that's how our air gets humidified and oxygenated. It's how it's how our you know our brain is nourished. Um, so, what seems like a a little thing can have huge implications on how our brain gets to heal and repair at night. Well, it's yesterday I was on the phone with, I mentioned the holistic doctor that I used to go to when I lived in St. Louis, who really solved my low back issues and some other challenges that I had intestinally and stuff like that. Well, you, you just remind me so much of him, but he's, this guy is, you know, probably in his mid sixties now. He's from Wisconsin. He used to go over to China to give lectures on Eastern medicine, and he's he just wrote a book on facial diagnosis. It's uh, the first time I ever visited him, and he's telling me everything about myself by looking at my face. I was like, what in the world is going on? And so, I don't know, you know, it's, it, I, I'm hearing these things you're saying, and so when I talked about having to believe a little bit in the therapy and in the doc, in the, in the, um, in the pediatric treatment you're going to get, I mean, there is some of this in his mind that, you know, I had to buy in, you know, I had to buy in acupuncture <laughs> having to impact my back and that kind of thing. That's so, yes. I mean, the reason I, I gave that, a, that example where, you know, for that, that one particular patient, the, the father where, uh, you know, if I said, I want you to go buy these because I don't, I don't, I'm not selling anything here. It's just, I just give it away and, and I'm just try this and see. So if I said, you know, here's a list, go, go home, take these things. Uh, the, like if somebody did that for me, I'd be like, uh, what? I, I don't know mm -hmm. that I, I want to just randomly blow money on, on something when like, give me the data, like show me how and why. Um, so that's why 
I the primary reason why I I buy I buy all the stuff that I do and I give it away because I want to make sure. Listen, if it done if it didn't work, I don't want somebody stuck. You know, I don't want a, a parent that just spent whatever. I mean, even fifteen twenty dollars on something and their child got worse or they they felt bad and now they're mm-hmm. stuck with something and you know that's you know we're trying to for me in in these contexts i'm first of all so many parents are asking is there can we do or try natural options first and the answer is sometimes is yes but if it's a pretty severe situation there are also i mean that's why i get the genetic tests and and all of these other things because i want the the broadest picture i can of of what's going on just even from a you know genetic proclivity um but you know the the you know the better better understanding we have of how how their body is functioning it just it makes it it takes a lot of the guessing out of it there's still a lot of tweaking but um it, when when I have new fa- new families come in, I'm like, so hey, you know what brought you in? Well, our neighbor is so and so, and I just start laughing, and I, and I just go, I know, crazy, huh? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> like we used to not be able to play, and all of a sudden, it's like they're like this happy <laughs> child, and it just, I'm like, I know, my, I'm, even though I hear that, I feel very blessed to hear that more times than not, but it also puts a lot more stress because. I, I could be looking at this child and, and think, you know what, if this were, this were my son and daughter, I, I would do a trial of, you know, guanfacine for two or three days, because I don't know if like, we don't have any information apart from just the, the things that you're telling me. And it, it, I find that most of the time as I'm listening to him, my brain, part of my other, the other part of my brain is sitting here just like running, <laughs> running this, mm-hmm. like this program, trying to integrate all of these behaviors. And then, you know, who lives at home? What do they eat? Um, you know, what are they watching? Uh, how many other factors are affecting how their brain is when they're trying to prepare for sleep? And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of factors that are out of my control also, but, you know, I think it's, it's all of that. It's if, if I don't know who lives at home, if I don't know, not what time they go to bed, but what time do they fall asleep and do they wake up? And if the parents are like, I don't know, I mean, anyway, so there's, it all matters, like all of it matters. And if we shortcut, like if I, if I shortcut any of those, I mean, it could have been as a mom's leaving, I'm like, you know what, I forgot to ask. And I ask a question and she's like, oh, yeah, that's been going on for two years. I'm like, how did, why, why did I not ask Mm. that? And I know why subconsciously, because I can't, like I've got two patients waiting and I know that if she says yes to this, that's another, another rabbit trail. Like it's, that's an entire visit. Right. And it's the thing that's like linking so many of it. Well, and I think to be fair, you know, you went through a lot of, um, I guess, test for my own daughter that would be definitely be considered more traditional medicine lab tests and a whole litany of of things to try and figure out what some of the data is telling you and I, you know for us at um and for the for the members of alliance for shared health i think it's important to say we're not trying to tell anybody um who they should see or not see. I think one of the things that I just love about you from a, the standpoint of how you serve your patients is, is you provide hope. And so many people come to you with their kids when when they just probably have gotten to a point where they've lost hope and they have no idea what to do. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, our office manager, Carrie, jokes. It's like, we're, we're like the last stop. That's that. It's like, what brought you in here? We've been to five or six other, you know, other places and, and nobody's been able to help. And we heard you would help. And I, I laugh. I'm like, listen, I can, can we help? Like, hopefully will I make it worse? Unlikely. So, so it's <laughs> unlikely that we'll make, make this situation worse. Can, can we make everything better? Mm, I don't know. But there's a very high probability that if this is our baseline right now, that I would say this, I'm like, I guarantee you that, that if we, we go through this process and, and, and we're able to get all of the information, the, whether it's imaging or, or I have a, an awesome network of colleagues that are, you know, OT, PT, OT for more reflex integration, uh, you know, like without them, I mean, they're like the, the work that they do 
for these kids. It's just my what I what people would consider my successes aren't. It's just it's a part of it, but it's the it's that that network of other providers that are experts at what they do and in in finding the things that that I can I know it's a problem. I just don't know how to how to mitigate it. And so, you know, it, it's it, you know, I'm humbled when, you know, parents will thank me, but I mean, I'm like you did the work. I just told you what to do. Mm-hmm. Like you're the ones do it. Like I just like do all this. Like if you would have said no, you wouldn't have been thanking me. And I just hope that that members um, of Ash who have challenges and think that you know their families are going through through things, they don't stop searching and they don't you know because you never know what a day can bring, uh, right? And and it's you might be one one phone call, one visit away from from the breakthrough that you're looking for for your child, for your spouse, for whoever it is. And you know I, I think that one of the interesting topics of our day and of this past year is COVID, right? And uh, how has that impacted your practice? And I mean, up in Washington, we, we were kind of in Seattle area, we were among the large uh, initial outbreaks. And so you are you seeing quite a few COVID patients? And I um, have a sense of that from talking to you, but I'll let you, I'll let you answer that. I, I wasn't uh, just primarily because if children do have it most of the time we don't even know it presents in in either different ways or very mild cold like symptoms or they just due to the differences in well, this is this is what this is what I had hypothesized early on in in February and March when I was looking at at the the literature coming out of China where you know for all intent and purposes kids were unaffected and and then looking at the difference between, you know, children and what happens to the body with senescence as we age and the, the you know, significantly decreased levels of vitamin D melatonin, which are integral for our innate immune system. Um, you know, I, I was fascinated by that because when we're hearing there's nothing to do except go home and cross your fingers. And if your symptoms get bad enough, come into the hospital. I, I you know, there's a part of me that rejects anybody that says there's nothing you can do to right. boost your immune system or, you know, whatever to, to mitigate, you know, life threatening symptoms of a virus. That, and even then we knew that there, it's, it's a variant, but we, we know about coronaviruses and the SARS and MERS. So it's, it's not like we're coming, coming, coming at this with a blank slate. So, mm-hmm. so I started studying every day. I started <laughs> going through virology podcasts and there's a an awesome, I don't know him, but the information he shares is, is awesome. Uh, Dr. Suhold out of, I think he actually went to Loma Linda and he's in the Redlands area in California. And he had this MedCram on YouTube and it was MedCram update for COVID. And so I listened to every one of those and early on, they were talking about ivermectin. There, you know, initially it was hydroxychloroquine, but ivermectin, and and then vitamin D, and and then there's another doc, doctor. His YouTube is Doctor Bean, and then he goes through the breakdown of the immunology, it's like what is going on, how it's affecting our 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 immune system, our pathways, Th one, Th two, inflammatory, you know, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, you know, how our body responds, why we need, why when you hit day seven or eight and you know, day seven, eight, nine, ten, and cell mediated immunity kicks in and the cytokine storm and everything goes, you know, downhill and and it's like a switch flips and all of a sudden these patients can't breathe. And 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 it was like, how come how come when I'm talking to like family members that are you know, surgeon or, or, you know, colleagues, and I'm asking questions. And they're like, I don't know, we haven't heard anything about that. And it's certainly not coming. It certainly wasn't being told to us by leaders of three letter government agencies. It was just, Mm -hmm. there's just no, there's no cure, there's no treatment. And um, it angered me. And so as you were doing this research, did you start to have some adults come in that had COVID or was it parents or what, what how did this kind of morph into because I you haven't necessarily hit on this but ah. you started to see some patients right um COVID patients I didn't and 
I did an interview and when that, uh, it was like Clark County. So I was sharing it online. I would, I would, um, a, like a parent would come in and they would say my, you know, like their mom or dad had it. And I was like, Oh, well, what were they told to do? Well, nothing, just go home and quarantine. I'm like, Whoa. So I would just write down like, okay, this is what I want you to have them do. And I would make a list and then like, I have some of it here. So I would just give them some stuff to, to take home. And then I would, depending on the course that they're in, I would prescribe, you know, if they were at that point where there was some respiratory issues or, you know, if suspected where it was getting close to, you know, possibly having to go in the hospital, I would do the, you know, ivermectin, Zithromax and, and dexamethasone and that along with the supplements, you know, I would say, you know, please let me know how they're doing. And, you know, I'd get a text three days later and it's, you know, like breathing way better still, you know, maybe some other issues going on, but they never had to go into the hospital. And then, Mm. you know, a few weeks later, their symptoms are gone. And, and then after doing the interview, uh, things just went crazy. The phone just started ringing. In fact, it was ringing off the hook. I mean, it was like the next day. And in fact, I just saw a family with an 18 year old today where she had been diagnosed and she was fine. And then a week and a half later, she got really sick. And they asked me today, like, you know, is she the youngest patient you've had, you know, that has called me? And I said, yeah, by far. Like, I haven't had any Mm -hmm. younger ones that were symptomatic, but she ended up having a lot of vascular issues by the time they they contacted me. And so at that point, it was they were asking, can you, you know, is there anything we can do to mitigate kind of that, what was kind of getting into some of the long hauler symptoms? And and unfortunately... I mean, she couldn't walk. Her feet were so swollen and painful. Her hands wow. were just blown up. Her face, she, I mean, she, she looked like she had like a cushioned moon facies. I mean, it was, it was pretty brutal. And, um, and mom sent me a text two days late because she had sent me all these pictures. It's like 1130 at night. I'm walking around in my driveway talking to this family. And uh, yeah, two days later, she sent me pictures and the swelling was gone and the rash was, had, had virtually completely disappeared. Wow. And that, so you saw this patient today also? Yeah, this is, this was is a follow. I, I had never right? seen him. This follow, was all over right. the phone. Yeah. Oh, so gotcha. Gotcha. So you, you mentioned these three, I think they were medicines, right? Pharmaceuticals. And then are there typically nutraceuticals that are just, you know, like the vitamin D and, and that, or just um, vitamins, or is it yeah, so some combination of things that typically are the most effective for, for people that come in with uh, COVID? So vi- vitamin D is, is so I'm, I'm just going to quote what, what actually Dr. Sewell had said based on literature, and it was, you know, for all intent and purposes, it, anybody whose vitamin D level is 60 or above, the, the and I'm not talking about somebody that's an end-stage you know, pancreatic cancer that gets COVID. I'm, I'm talking an otherwise, you know, healthy, healthy human being that has vitamin D levels that are 60 and above the, the likelihood of mortality is basically zero. And so just that, that, that hormone. Um, but I, my, the regimen that I started for myself, that I'd shell my wife start, my mom that I just initially had told all my friends and then tell, just tell people, to do this was vitamin D. I for me, I did ten thousand because my vitamin D was only at thirty-seven, and that was taking five thousand I use every day. The range is thirty to a hundred, but I mean, anything under forty is useless in terms of mm. innate immune mm-hmm. system or activating our you know B cells. So, so uh, vitamin D, NAC, and acetylcysteine. And if you look at the you know people again you know even friends of mine that are you know well versed in medicine that are practitioners just kind of scoff at it but you know you, you know do a google on on nac and you know von willebrand's factor and you know so using using that can be effective at helping decrease the thrombotic events that are seen with some of these intermediate or longer long hauler patients so um so, sorry, vitamin D, mm. NAC, zinc, 50 milligrams, 
and uh, melatonin. And why? And melatonin? people think, oh, melatonin sleep. Melatonin is probably one of the more potent immunomodulators in our body. Um, it's, in fact, for for a, a couple of weeks ago, I had a fam, family of, of six, and mom and dad were were quite sick. And I remember talking to to the mom, and she, I could hear her struggling to breathe. And and her husband was on the line. I'm like, listen, I'm going to tell you what I recommend. You can then say you're crazy. Why that? And I'll explain it. But just I want you to to get on this immediately. And it was. It was uh, having her do five milligrams of melatonin spaced out five times a day, broken up. So she was doing that. And that night I had her take uh, 20 milligrams at bedtime. And she texted me the next morning and she, she has asthma. So I was like, do you, you know, I had her use her asthma inhaler. I prescribed budesonide for, for her, uh, for her nebulizer and, and had her triple basically everything, had her double her vitamin D and then her NAC three mm-hmm. times a day and zinc to a hundred, you know, just boosting all those. And then had, I told, told them to make sure tomorrow go get some, some liposomal glutathione, which is another very potent, you know, free radical scavenger. And it also helps to decrease the, the likelihood of thrombotic events. And, uh, anyways, so I got a text the next day from, from, her, from the father, from her husband. And he was just, I had him do the same thing. He was not quite as bad. And he said, it's the first night of sleep he's had in three days. And when he woke up, he was, his breathing was virtually, I mean, the respiratory symptoms were virtually gone and his wife was still sleeping. Wow. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a good thing, right? I mean, he had to, yeah, just, yeah she hadn't slept. She was static, up, she would, she'd right. be up coughing or just having trouble breathing. She was sleeping pretty upright. I mean, she, you know, she had to have the head of the bed elevated. And, and anyways, and I talked to her later that day and she said, I can't believe it. I, I'm like, I know I hear that all the time where people, where, where they're doing those higher doses, then we walk it back down. But, but it's, it's, sure. it's probably one of the things that I hear more often is, is this stunned response about how much better they felt respiratory wise and all of that interstitial leakage into the lungs. I mean, it's, that's barring oxygen exchange. That's bad right? Like that's not a good thing. And it, it, you know, it's, it's not just, I mean, it's impact at mitigating the, the TH1 pathway. So all of those pro-inflammatory markers, uh, interleukin six, that cytokine storm, I mean, actively blame it. It's just like shutting off those, those switches, those markers, capsase one and, uh, you know, NLRP or what is it? NLRP three. I mean, uh, uh, inflammasomes, like all of these things that do damage to our tissue. It's like, nope. Mm-mm. It just starts switching those signals off. I mean, again, it doesn't do it exactly like that, but anyway, it's, it's a very potent, very potent hormone. Wow. It's, uh, you know, I think there's so much going on in our country from uh, the standpoint of what, what COVID has done and what it's taken away. And a lot of, there's a lot of fear, obviously. And people are, some people are, you know, so worried about being around anybody, close to anybody who isn't wearing a mask. Some people are just deathly afraid of, of what happens if I get COVID or a family member gets COVID. And, and you know, we I, I've never heard you say you think you have all the answers and we're certainly not telling people, you know, this is the miracle cure or whatever. And I think there's a lot of people that have some fear that has cultivated has been cultivated in our society over this and covid in general it seems like it it impacts a very very small percentage of the population you know the numbers better than i and there there are solutions out there that um at least apparent solutions that have a chance to give maybe some of our listeners some hope and maybe alleviate some fear and i don't know if that's uh how you would characterize it but i'd love to hear your thoughts on that because of doing the the interview I'm going to divert a little bit. It's when I agreed to do it, Shelly was kind of freaking out. She's like, seriously, like, like you just can't fly under the radar, can you? And, <laughs> and he's like, like, do not, you know, don't, don't give somebody a reason to, you know, to whatever, you know, I mean, in these crazy times. And I remember, and so I was like, well, what about when, you know, like, what about your friend? Right. What about, what about if somebody would have had the information? What if, what if they would have known that if they took 12 milligrams of ivermectin 
the likelihood that he would have gone into the into the hospital on day 13 and never come home, right? Like that that happened to one of her best friend's dads, somebody that she grew up oh, with. No. And it's like, and that was this summer and it, it broke my heart. I was angry. I was, I was absolutely livid because when, when he went in and I had Shelly talking to his, you know, to the mom and asking like, what are they doing? What, how are they treating? And they put him on oxygen. If, you know, some will give the, you know, dexamethasone. If they finally get pneumonia, they'll treat with an antibiotic and, you know, they're transferred to the ICU remdesivir, which has no, based on the data, there's at that point, it just, it's, it's too late for that. There's, there's too much damage. And so, and and anyway, she asked me if, if they would have, you know, my friend would have called a week ago, what would have happened? I'm like, he would be alive. Like hundred percent. He'd be alive. He was an otherwise healthy 63 year old man that was told to go home and quarantine and didn't do, wasn't told to do anything. And, and I'm like, you know what, I might get in trouble or might get some heat or they might close us down. But if this information gets out to even a few people that I can't, obviously I don't have, or I haven't taken the time, whatever, to, to disseminate it. But if, if me doing this interview can, can help families to not have to go through what, what your friend just did, like, how can I not talk to somebody that's willing to share it? Like that's, that's, I can't not, it's just, there's, there's no, like, well, I don't know. It's just, the answer is just yes. And anyways, and and after doing it, even though I, I didn't get to edit it, because I could go through that, through the interview and pick it apart, because I'm like, oh, geez, no, no, the CDC did not do a study on vitamin D. That, that did not happen. But um, but yeah, the phone started ringing. And it was just, we, we read the article, we watched the video, and we were just hoping that maybe, you know, he would be willing to, to treat us. And it kept happening over and over. And, and then, you know, I started getting sicker and sicker patients, you know, this whole thing that, you know, you, you you might see on, you know, with social media where, you know, it's never been isolated, or it's not a real virus. It's, it is not the flu, right? There's the, the, the damage that it does. And, and for certain people, like if I got it, well, I did, but if I got it and I didn't do anything, I would be in a lot of trouble just based on the labs that I've run, my low glute, like with my, proclivities for immune system. If I was taking nothing and I just was told to stay at home, I would not fare well. So even this whole idea that we don't know how or why some people do far worse than others, it's like, well, we kind of do. It's just, we don't do anything to look to see who's at higher risk. So um, as of yesterday, I had treated, I think my 90, 96, 96 family, 96 patient across the board. Uh, First of all, no one went to the hospital. No one has gone to the hospital after taking ivermectin. Not a single one of these patients had to go to the hospital. Um, And apart from uh, a phone call that I got from Michigan, from a the daughter of a 84 year, 84 year old mom and 88 year old dad and 63 year old sister who are caring for them, um, he their dad passed away on uh, New Year's Day, and Mm -hmm. she wrote. And and this one was hard. I mean, they're both they're all really sick, and the parents had number of comorbidities. He had congestive heart failure, you know, chronic lung disease. He was on four liters of oxygen a lot going and on. Yeah. a lot going on. And so they, they all started the, the treatment on the 28th and by the 30th, uh, his wife, the 84 year old, uh, her symptoms were gone. The daughters were lingering, but more cold symptoms. So all respiratory issues were gone. And after doing some bit more more excessive stuff, crushing up N acetylcysteine and putting it in his nebulizer with budesonide and 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 ivermectin and and uh, doxycycline and then quercetin. I haven't talked about quercetin, but I had him doing like five hundred milligrams of quercetin three times a day. He was doing the five milligrams of melatonin five times, and then that night he did uh, either forty or sixty milligrams of melatonin. And when he woke up on the 31st, his oxygen levels were higher than they were before getting COVID. And you know, I, I got this long. No, no, so go ahead, finish. Yeah. And then after that message from the sister that was caring for him, I didn't hear anything. I, I was checking in. I was texting the, the other sister in Michigan, and she was asking, have you heard? And then I got a message on New Year's Day from, from the gal in Michigan that her dad had passed away. And hmm. so... She told, you know, it, I, I was, I was, you know, I was just reading it, just kind of tears in my eyes. And she said that about three weeks ago, 
he had, you know, he'd been sick for a long time and he said, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm tired of fighting and, you know, everything's all in place. And she said that uh, after I talked to him, he stopped taking all of the supplements, all of the meds. She said he wanted to stay alive to make sure that his wife was okay. Mm. You know, while we were, as you mentioned, ivermectin, I just did a little Google search here and I'm trying to figure out why the FDA, and maybe we have our own opinions and should keep them to ourselves, but why the FDA would basically say this isn't uh, an alternative treatment or a use for it isn't COVID. And I don't know if that's even a path you want to go down, but I... Well, here's a question that I've had from the beginning. How come nobody for this for this virus that, that I mean, it hasn't killed you know, well over 300,000. I mean, the, 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 the data is as off as the PCR testing, which is just, just a horrible test. But, you know, why, why when certain leadership would say, get outside, get sunshine, like vitamin D is really important. And then in the media, all we see is so-and-so says that sunshine kills COVID. It's like, no, no, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that that a very powerful hormone that is critical for our body's innate immune system allows for, for our immune system to start fighting this virus immediately. Within hours, there's recruitment of our immune system to go go investigate. And it's like, ah, oh, here's a pathogen. What's this? It's not supposed to be here. And it tells a neutrophil, go get it. Boom. And a macrophage comes and engulfs that. And it takes it to our, our lymph. And CD4 is like, who is this? this? You're not supposed to be here. Let's activate. Go get it. Like that's that's not like silliness. That's that's how it works. Like why why don't kids get sick? And this is just my hypothesis. They have way more melatonin than my mom. And so they've mm-hmm. got they've got a very powerful anti-inflammatory Im- immune modulating hormone that's keeping keeping those those pro-inflammatory pathways from kicking in. And so wh- you know, th- why why from somebody that says, listen, we don't have the data, we haven't done the studies, but anecdotally, we know based on our understanding from SARS and MERS and H1N1, we we know that these could possibly be beneficial. And there's no data that shows there's any potential, you know, there's there's any side effects from, you know, a medication that I treat scabies and head lice with to kids. Like, why hasn't anybody said that? And why when people do speak up, there, there, are, there are disciplinary actions or they're fired or or their licenses are revoked? Like, the, that's, that's the question, not... Not why aren't they, you know, approving it. It's why are they aggressively shutting down the information that should be not only spoken about from every platform. And so, yeah, you don't want to get in. I mean, yeah, I can I can tell you the why, but. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I, I it wouldn't it be great if we had get back to a place where it's our collective schools of thought and working together that solves problems instead of just you know if you don't have one school of thought that everybody's saying this is a school of thought you should have and you kind of get pushed back and i I, there's so many amazing people that are that have been gifted with so many uh great gifts that have been put inside of them and uh, you're certainly one of those i I, i'm really grateful because you know we this this particular podcast we call it Running Eyes, and I don't reference it a lot, but um, really it was named from Second Chronicles sixteen nine, which is the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those whose heart is loyal to Him, that He may strongly support. And sometimes we get uh, I get an opportunity to sit down with friends like you and people that I that I've gotten to know, and they just have a boldness and. You know, it takes a boldness to share some of these things that uh, can be called, you, you know, whatever kind of label can be put on them. And, you know, I'm grateful that you're willing to share and, you know, health share in general and members of health shares are already using an alternate access point or an alternate way to get their health care needs met. And so. I don't know. You know, I, I really am diligent about thinking through who I should talk to on this podcast. And uh, I'm just glad we know each other. And I'm glad that you're willing to spend time with me at this late hour. And uh, I'm not sure if you have any anything else you'd like to add before I let you go for the night here. I mean, I guess this is pretty I mean, it's uh, thanks for inviting me on. It's fun. It's it's interesting. It, even for sometimes when I when I'm talking through it, it's there will be things that will pop up in my head where it, it reminds me of just something else where I'm like, uh oh, 
like I need to make sure I contact that that family. So, uh, but um, I I think a it's it's sad that that we're using that, that we that that word is is brought up that it that it's bold or you know that it's dangerous to share truth. I mean, these this isn't there is so much data. If I wasn't positive about the the treatments not doing harm, right? I mean, like, is it going to cure everybody? Mm, depending on when they start it, almost yes, but but that it's not going to do harm and versus doing nothing. I mean, the the number of, of inquiries and hits on my license just just for sharing the, the science of it. And it's just, it's like, there's a part of me where it's a little stressful and Shelly's freaking out about it where, you know, are we going to get shut down and, and why do you keep doing it? And And I don't think it's bold. It's just... Like if I didn't think that, you know, it's not like I was super smart and I'm like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to Google this or I'm going to, you know, like it's, it's not just Googling, but like doing, you know, scholarly research, you know, like reading a lot of some more abstract things or going back in, in, you know, to 2001, 2002 and reading things that they were using. But like if I, like, that's not me just knowing it. I've, I've been, well, this is the way I look at it. I've been guided every step of the way, like, like some of the clicks that seem so random or the things that show up or some, some pop up on the screen. I'm like, the heck, what's that? I've never even heard of that. And I click on it and I'm like, whoa, why don't I know this? And, and so I guess I look at it more in the context of, I think it would be bold to not do it. Like, I think it'd be like, if I was, if I was sitting there at night, wandering around the house at night, having, having some, some time with with God and and if he said, Hey, what have you done with this? Like who have you shared it with? And I said, Well, I'm a little nervous. I don't think I could I, that's not a conversation I could have with him. I mm. like I would I would probably do the you know the Adam thing and run and hide because it's not I guess it's not bold when 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 it's just when it's the only path that you when it's the only thing that you can do and for your conscience to to have peace. It's 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 not boldness. It's I think it's just a necessity. It's just it's just what you do. Like like, you, like there isn't another way to to act. Like you just it's when you're given the opportunity to share truth that can help one person or fifty or like the like I consider it a privilege that these families are calling and asking, will you help me? I'm like, yeah. It's like no duh. So anyway, well, in in Malachi it says that you know the scripture is talking about tithing at this point, but it says. God says to test me now in this, and and so in, in being faithful and tithing, and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing on you. There's not room enough to contain it. And we talk, you talked about, okay, well, how could I sit around and and have a conversation with God and say, well, I'm kind of hesitant to do this or that. I think what it boils down to is for those who are who have faith and say, and faith is also you know action, as it says in James. There's no faith without works, right? So you have to, uh, there, there, there's never a time where I think God would say, well, why'd you give so much of your time? Why'd you give so much of your money? Why did you, why did you sow into people's lives? And so I just think those things are part and parcel of that verse in Malachi that says, do these things, honor me with these gifts, and I'll pour out the windows of heaven. And so I'm just believing that this is going to get to the to the right people at the right time. They're going to hear this and go, okay, there, there's another, there's some options. Maybe it gets to them right on time. Um, again, not professing it's the perfect cure for everybody. And I sure believe in what you're doing, and I want people to hear it. Is there a website where people wanted to learn more that, that you guys have, Scott, where people could go and learn a little bit more? What I would recommend is go to the uh, FLCCC. That's uh, Dr. Pierre Corey. In fact, like uh, just watch the YouTube of, of uh, Dr. Corey. Uh, Senate hearing and and uh, you know the and here's the thing that's angering. This was October. Like we knew about we knew about the paper antigen testing in April. We knew about the ivermectin studies in April. Like this isn't like this is not new information. They had to wait long enough so that they wouldn't get you know decimated. But even after doing that, even after going in and having these these doctors who have been extremely successful curing thousands of patients, the opposition, the articles that were written about it. And that's, that's the problem, the, the cognitive dissonance that's going on with, with the media and what they're telling, telling Americans, it's, there isn't, 
there isn't hope, there isn't a cure, wait for the vaccine. And and then Fauci's like, well, the vaccine, you could you it could take two to three months to develop antibodies. So you get the shot, but you still have to socially distance, stay at home, can't go to work, can't live. And then Dr. Michael Mina out of Harvard, a virologist, is like, well, you know, we don't know how long you're going to have the, you know, the antibodies. So, you know, you might not have antibodies after two to three months. So it's like, okay, so it could take two mm. to three months for antibodies to kick in. And by the time they kick in, they might not, which is it? So if we don't know, and and we're told to get it, but you can get it, but you still have to do all of these precautionary things as we're entering this dark winter. Um, why not do the things that have been anecdotally proven time after time after time? Like 95 is a small, you know, it's an anecdote of 95. But for those 95 people, uh, it's like throwing the starfish back into the ocean. So that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. So anyways, well, so, yeah, I, I would, yeah, I, I would tout it message. to anybody. Mm, I appreciate that immensely. And I, I sure enjoy the time that we get to spend together. I know you're crazy busy, and I know the nights uh, get late for you, and you want to get to see your family and your kids too. So thank you for taking time to visit with us and just to be a blessing and an encouragement. And uh, I hope in some ways that you uh, were blessed by the time as well. Always, Corey. I, I, I love our conversations. It's um, I, I will always make time to to be able to, I mean, not just this, just anytime. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you, my friend. Have a great night. All right. Take care. Well, I had, uh, you know, it's such an interesting conversation with Scott and it's, uh, I felt like it was a conversation that was important to have. And I know that there are all kinds of different viewpoints out there and lots of different thought processes behind COVID. And Scott was very quick to point out that this is a very real virus that is different. It's not the flu. And he also, I think, intimates that we don't have to walk and live in fear. And that's why I just wanted to wanted to get his message out about the impact that he's had with his patients. No one on no one listening here has to buy into a word of it. And I'm sure hopeful that people that 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 if that there's somebody out there that this has a positive impact on. And I know Scott has certainly had a a tremendous impact on his patients. I'm grateful personally for the impact that he's had on my daughter's life. And uh, and it's it's just members of Alliance for Shared Health are in a health share program and they're in an alternate form of accessing their health care needs. And so I'd say members of ASH tend to be a little more open to alternative ways of, of getting treatment and getting taken care of. So I hope in some small way this was an encouragement to somebody out there and i'm looking forward to doing this again with the next guest so thanks for joining me i appreciate you taking the time and the willingness to sit down and spend your time listening to running eyes until next time have a great night